Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining, Bobby. I'll I'll get us started, and then we'll I'll turn the turn the time to you if that's Perfect. all right. Sounds okay. good. Sounds good. Sorry for the little hiccup with uh, starting this. I'm glad you guys all hung in there, and you are are still here because I think this is a very important presentation. Um, so I'll just give everybody just one more minute to to get logged in. And we'll start at 4.05 New York time. Well, that's right. We, we've got people all over the country in here, huh? Actually, probably all over the world. All over the world. That's right. Awesome. 35 states. I can't recall how many countries, but there are several. Oh, that's fantastic. I think it's pretty late in Europe right now. 15 countries was what wow. they said. 15. Fantastic. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the first session of the COVID serious syndrome conference for 2021. Thank you all for attending and being here. My name is Ryan cook and I'll be moderating this session. Just to, just a little bit about me. I'm a member of the board of directors for the CSS foundation. I have three children, twins who are six and Charlie who is two. Charlie was diagnosed with CSS in 2020 when he was around 15 months old. He has the DPF2 variant, which is a gene that has recently been associated with CSS, I think in 2018. So there's not that many people yet that have that one. I'm an attorney and I live in Connecticut in the United States. And it's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, so just some housekeeping, and I think Shay covered a lot of this. It might be repetitive, so I'll move quickly through this part. But uh, just so you know, everyone other than the speakers should be muted. Uh, if a speaker wants to see or hear somebody in attendance, uh, that person should receive a prompt to unmute. The chat function, I believe, uh, should won't allow you to send messages to everyone, although maybe that's changed given this uh, this most recent scenario. Uh, but we should be able to, those moderating and speaking should be able to see the questions that come through. So please send questions through the chat box and I will try to ask them to Bobby at the end of the session. We're recording this, uh, at least the speaker view should be recording and we might use it in the future. The gallery view with all our pictures won't be recorded. So unless you're actively speaking, uh, you shouldn't be recorded. Sorry. No, I'm calling me. Don't. It looks like maybe people can unmute. Hey. So. Hi, everybody. How was the cool? How was we cool? mute? Let me mute. Let me try to mute Janelle. All right, I think I was muted as well as part of that, but uh, I'm back now. I hope. Okay, uh, we reserve the right to remove anyone who engages in inappropriate conduct. I don't expect that to happen. There are English captions available. Uh, click the CC live transcript icon and enable auto transcription for that. For the recordings, we're planning to have captioning available in other languages as well. Uh, there should be a lobby room available for other people to connect before or after or even during these sessions. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, the CSS Foundation. If you're posting anything uh, about the conference or CSS this weekend, use these hashtags, uh, my CSS fam or CSS Conf 2021. If you want to get involved in the foundation, we've got all kinds of volunteer opportunities. Visit our website, covidcirrus.org, or send an email to foundation at covidcirrus.org. Okay, so this session is about financial planning. Uh, I know that most of us did not plan to receive a CSS diagnosis in our lives. And while we can't change that diagnosis, we can plan for a future with it. And I wanna do my best to make sure that Charlie will have the financial security that he needs to live his best life. And I'm sure that you feel similarly for your loved ones with CSS. Of course, CSS comes with a lot of challenges, physical, developmental, social, emotional. Uh, the foundation hopes that through this session, the CSS community will be better prepared to meet the financial challenges that CSS can bring. 
And to that end, we have an expert in the field of special needs financial planning who will share some of his insights with us today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bobby Howell. Bobby has been in the financial planning business since 2015. He's originally from California, but he moved up the West Coast of the United States to Portland, Oregon to attend Portland State University, where he studied business finance. He played on the Portland State Vikings football team. That's American football, not soccer, <laughs> uh, for those of you outside the, uh, outside the U.S. And he was also an undergraduate assistant coach on the team. Early in his career, Bobby was able to help some special needs families with their financial planning, and he learned to love helping these families. He joined Palladio Consulting in 2019 to work exclusively with families who have loved ones with disabilities. And outside work, Bobby likes to spend time with his fiance, their cat, playing golf and pool and getting all types of exercise. So thank you, Bobby, for being here with us today. Appreciate you. And we'll let you take it from here, but please, everyone, remember to submit questions for the last part of the session, and I'll try to ask them. Go ahead, Bobby. Awesome. Ryan, well, I, uh, I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see. Let's pull you guys there. That's the one we want. All right. And now I'm going to confirm. Can everybody see that? All right. Just a couple I, thumbs I can, up. I can see it, Bobby. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Ryan, thanks again for the uh, for the introduction. Um, like you mentioned, uh, we, yeah, we've we've been working exclusively with with special needs families now. Um, my my business partner Connor uh, actually started Palladio Consulting about ten years ago. So, um, really excited to be here. Uh, like you mentioned, we are actually based in in Portland, Oregon. And I really wanted to to do my best in making sure that this presentation for everybody today is um, is applicable to all situations. Now, obviously, a lot of this will be uh, United States benefits that we'll go over. Um, but again, we'll we'll try to uh, to make sure it's it's uh, yeah as as applicable as as possible. So. Kind of an important disclosure here. Uh, unlike Ryan, I am not an attorney. Uh, we want to make sure we we make that clear. Um, we will be going over some some financial planning topics, some government benefits planning, um, as well as special needs trusts and able accounts and and all those great things. But again, we're not uh, we're not necessarily making any specific recommendations today. We just want to we kind of want to get the uh, the wheels turning for some of the families out there that this might be. I would say probably more of the scary parts of of what comes with uh with a diagnosis and so that's why we exist we realize that there's there's just so many benefits out there um and i don't know what state you live in but uh, our state isn't necessarily picking up the phone and and ringing our families letting them know for the things that they qualify for uh, and all the rules and, and important things that come along with that and so that's essentially uh that's essentially you know why we why we began doing what we began doing in the first place is this there's there's just a huge need in this community um and yeah and we're excited to be here so a quick overview of us we've now worked with over 3500 families across i believe it's 10 states um we do specialize i would say in in uh, in california washington oregon specific benefits but um but again all over the country our goal is to essentially be as involved with the family's planning as we can. And what I mean by that is we're coordinating everything from financial specific needs to working with your attorney and making sure that uh, your special needs trust is drafted to align with your ultimate vision for your loved one. It's also going to include ultra important government benefits planning, retirement planning. Obviously, you're, you're now in, in a way planning for three retirements. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, the involvement that we have is, is always aligning with, with your ultimate vision for your loved one. And yeah, and then we're kind of there every step of the way. So a little bit of an agenda of, of what we'll work through today. And you know what, actually, before I get to that, I want everybody, if you guys could, so there's my email address. 
I have a feeling there might be quite a few questions today. Uh, and if we can't get to them, and, and I'll have my email at the end as well, but write it down. Um, we would be more than happy to have a 20, 30 minute phone call to answer any really specific questions that that you guys may have that might not apply to everybody on the call today. Uh, but again, we want to make sure that that this information is being passed along and um, and you guys, you know, get your uh, get your worthwhile out of it. So I just want to make sure I made that available. First, we'll go over kind of the timeline and and when to start thinking about certain topics and to begin planning for certain things. It doesn't really matter, you know, uh, the, the age of your loved one at this point. We want to make sure that you understand where are you at, what can be done now, and what are some of the things you might want to be thinking about for the future. And leads right into what is the vision of the future. We'll go through some of the important questions that we're asking families on a weekly basis of making sure that the habits and the things that we're putting in place now do align with our, our vision for our loved one's future. Letter of intent, uh, it's a document, another one that if you guys would like it, uh, I can shoot it out to you. Um, we'll get to that when we get to it. We'll discuss SSI versus SSDI, a very complicated uh, and often confused uh, benefit program that will make sure that we, we can kind of differentiate the two and understand how it might help us uh, down the road. We'll touch on Medicaid today. We won't go into it a ton um, because, again, I do want to make sure we have plenty of time to discuss trust planning as well as ABLE accounts, which uh, are very important, uh, very important tools in, in long-term special needs planning. We'll go through some key takeaways and then we'll have some time at the end for hopefully some Q&A. And uh, again, I'll try to I'll try to work my way through as quickly as possible so we can get some of those questions done. Uh, but if we don't, again, shoot me an email and we'll make sure that uh, any, any questions you guys have get answered. So this, this timeline line that we use, before I pull it up on the screen, uh, I guess I don't want there to be any sticker shock or, oh my gosh, my, my son or daughter is, is, is 21 and I've, uh, and I've missed the, I've missed the bus. It's, uh, it's not meant to do that at all. It's simply here to show exactly what it is and um, when you might benefit from some of these benefits that are out there. And so stage one, and I, I, I can see camera, so it looks like I think we have quite a few uh, families and currently in this stage, but obviously early diagnosis, um, these are all the, the conversations that we're having. So working through IEP plans uh, with your school, in Oregon, it's called the Oregon K plan, um, but community first, it's it's Medicaid program through, uh, through your county or state. Stage two, when we're approaching that age 18, that obviously brings up a, a, an entirely new set of questions. It's, do I need guardianship? What is guardianship? Um, are there any alternatives? What's an ABLE account and, and how might it benefit our situation? Is college in the vision? Medicaid, all of a sudden, your son or daughter is now age of majority, and um, they now qualify for things that they've never qualified for in the past. Now we're moving on to parents are looking to retire. How do the benefits shift at that point? And that's why we'll work through uh, what SSDI is and, and how you can utilize that. Housing. Housing is a huge one, and, and it's something that... Um, the supply, at least in uh, in our area, Portland, supply is very short compared to the demand. And so, thinking about housing as early as possible is often a good a good idea as well. And then, stage four: what happens when you're no longer here? What can we be doing now to make sure that you know when you are laying on that deathbed, you know without a shadow of a doubt that your loved one's going to be well taken care of, and and you've put in the the very important uh, planning tools in place to, to make sure that, that, you know, you sleep well at night. So these are just a few questions that, again, not meant to overwhelm anybody, but these are things that, uh, that I would say really start thinking about and start talking about and, and kind of come up with an idea of you know, what is, what is our, our, our vision and, and uh, our child's goals? 
if you if something were to happen to you, what would the situation look like? Where would they go to live? Um, you know, who is kind of part of their support team? What style and type of education would be appropriate? What level of independence or care will be needed down the road and how to properly plan for that? Like I mentioned earlier, will I need to become guardian at age 18? Who else is involved? How, how big can I build this support team? Lifestyle, recreational activities. What are things that you want to make sure uh, that your loved one is going to be able to enjoy for the remainder of their life, uh, even when you're no longer here? And as an employment or uh, vocational opportunity somewhere down the road. And ultimately, what are the expenses of this vision and how do we make it happen? So very quickly, our letter of intent, again, um, there's my email address again. It is, we kind of call this like, I mean, it's essentially the the Bible of your child's life. It's everybody that, uh, that is part of their support system, key people, routines, medications, everything that if something were to happen to you tomorrow, this document is gonna go into somebody's hands and they're gonna be able to understand from A to Z, everything about your child. Uh, ultra important document, not a legal document, but but we always recommend that, that families do keep this uh, completely filled out, updated on an annual basis, and they keep it with their estate planning documents. And like I said, uh, it could be as simple as in the subject line, write letter of intent, shoot me an email. That'll let me know to, to send you the, the fillable PDF. So, okay. So the often overwhelming and confusing world of SSI versus SSDI. At its core, they are they sound very similar. They could not be more different. Supplemental security income is a needs-based benefit. So an individual, if they're under the age of 18, they will be based off their parents' income and assets. And so you as parents, if you have more than $2,000 of countable assets, that's retirement accounts, checking, savings, anything that is essentially spendable um, or income over $1,652 per month, your child will not qualify for SSI. Now, when they turn 18, they would, and we'll get to the planning and some of the th important things that come, that come along with that. SSDI is an entitlement benefit. So an individual would receive that benefit if their parents had paid into social security and were earned working credits during their working years. And we'll get into the, the details of those numbers as well. So like I mentioned, first to qualify, an individual must meet social security's definition of disability and have limited income and assets. Like I mentioned, for a minor, this would be their parents' assets and income. We've had, um, countless families call in and say, hey, I, I was told, you know, my, my son received a, a diagnosis. We have it documented from the doctor. We were told that Social Security, he would now qualify for Social Security. We put in an application and we got a denial within a week. Um, you know, what does this mean? And, and oftentimes families just don't understand that it, it's until that individual is of age majority or 18 or um, and there's a couple states where I believe it's it's 19 or 21. Until they reach that age of majority, they will be based off the parents' income and assets. The purpose of this benefit is to provide monthly income for the most basic of necessities. The, the federal amount is $794 per month. I believe in California, there's a supplement and a few other states where cost of living might be a little bit more. There's, there is a supplement to that. Um, but again, $794 a month is not making anybody rich. Um, it's not necessarily that we're after that income. What we're really after is, is unlocking all the benefits that come along with, with qualifying for needs-based benefits, Medicaid, uh, a county caseworker, things like that, which, which we'll get to as well.
like I mentioned, some states provide a, stu- a supplement to this amount. I apologize to, to those worldwide. Um, I'm not incredibly uh, educated on the, uh, on the global government benefits, but like I said, we'll kind of fly through these so we can get to some of the, uh, the trust planning and, um, and estate planning as well. So, so SSDI, like I said, is a little different. Um, individual has to uh, have been diagnosed prior to age 22. So everybody on, on this call would obviously qualify for that. Um, like I said, this benefit would not begin. And here's kind of a helpful timeline just to put a, I guess, a, a visual to this, which just, just can be so confusing. An individual would start receiving their social security benefit at age 18. So today is their 18th birthday. Boom, $794 per month. Now, when their parents retire and start drawing Social Security, at that point, they're able, a adult disabled child, again, diagnosed prior to age 22, is then eligible to receive 50% of their parents' Social Security income, of their SSDI income. Pretty awesome benefit. Now, your, your question might be, well, can somebody be on both SSI and SSDI? Potentially, yes. Uh, we, it's not that common, but if, if the SSDI payment is low enough to not offset the SSI payment, then the individual would receive the difference of the two. If it were, in this example, twelve over $1,200 a month, uh, the individual would obviously no longer be receiving SSI. They would now be receiving SSDI. When the parent passes away, that benefit goes from 50% to 75%. And that individual will receive that income in perpetuity for the rest of their life. Ryan, I'll check in with you if any questions up to this point. I know that that one is a, that one can be a, a little hard to digest without, uh, without some time, but. Yeah, I think it is hard to digest. I don't have any questions that have come through the chat box yet. So this is just a good reminder to everybody. If you do have a question for Bobby, please uh, send us a question uh, as we go and we'll, I'll make a list of all those and try to get to them. Perfect. We're not going to go a ton into Medicaid, even though I would love to, um, (laughs) in in our opinion, Medicaid is uh, far and beyond uh, the most important needs-based benefit. We have, uh, we have a very wide range of, of families from very low income to, to higher net worth that come in. And for the, the higher net worth families, the question is, you know, it, it's been a real headache keeping our son or daughter's assets below $2,000. Um, it's, it's something we have to check in every month. We're reporting their wages if they're employed. It's, it's just too much. I mean, it, it, are the needs-based benefits really worth it? And bottom line is, Absolutely. Um, if you were to pay a personal support work hour um, and private pay it, that's, that's going to be over $7 million um, over the course of an individual's life. And so the fact of the matter is, is qualifying for these needs-based benefits really is the, the core concept of, of having a special needs trust or having an ABLE account. If these benefits weren't that important, then these other tools wouldn't exist. And again, it'd be accessed through your, your own county. Um, please let me know if you guys have follow. I'm sure there's follow up questions to this and you might not want to dive into government benefits on the, on this call today, but, but please feel free to write me an email. I'd, I'd love to have the conversation and at least point you in the right direction. Okay. Special needs trusts. One of the most foundational components uh, to a life care plan and, and creating an estate plan is, is having a special needs trust. The question becomes, you know, hey, I, all I, I, I own my home and I have a little bit in a, in a retirement account. Is it really necessary? And the bottom line is that anything that you pass on in the future when you're no longer here could potentially disqualify your loved one for needs-based benefits. And so the we can't understate the importance of having a special needs trust. Now, the reason it allows an individual to continue to receive these benefits is that the trust is essentially its own entity. 
And so when you pass on assets, real estate, whatever it may be, those things can actually be owned by the trust for the benefit of your loved one. You would name a trustee, whether it be a sibling, um, you know, a, a really trusted family friend that knows your your loved one on a, on a personal basis. Um, or if there's nobody that really fits that description, we have a, a, a massive network of professional trustees that, that we refer to families as well. There's pros and cons to both. Um, and again, that's a conversation we could have at a later time. But for conceptual purposes, just know that the trust holds the assets. The assets, when they're held by the trust, they are not in your son or daughter's name. Therefore, your son or daughter can receive those ultra important needs based benefits. The trustee is the one that's communicating with your son or daughter to have that relationship on an ongoing basis. So the trust can make distributions for important things for your loved one. A very, very important, uh, I guess, point to make here is the special needs trust needs to have specific language within it that allows for certain things. And again, we won't we won't go deep into to trust language today, but having it uh, allow for able account distributions, having it allow for housing and food, um, they're just it's 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 can't be understated how important it is. So, what can it purchase? Anything for the benefit of the individual, the primary benefit of the individual. So obviously we could we could go into every single one of these things and uh, and spend a ton of time on it. But the SSI benefit is meant to pay for very basic, basic needs. Um, now, I don't, again, I don't know where everybody is on this call, but $794 a month uh, in Portland, Oregon doesn't get you very far. <laughs> And so what the trust essentially allows you to do is supplement, um, supplement that income to provide a level of, of lifestyle that, you know, that your loved one has become accustomed to living uh, ever since, you know, you've raised them. So again, that, that SSI benefit will be used for housing and food, but once that amount has been used for those things, the special needs trust can now step in and provide a level of care for your loved one uh, that is up to, to what your vision and your goals are. It ultimately comes down to how the trust is drafted. I can't tell you how many times we've had a family come in and say, you know, actually we're, we have our trust, we're good to go. Um, you know, we just wanna focus on XYZ and, and they'll bring in the trust document and we'll, we'll read through it and we realize like I said, it doesn't mention anything about an ABLE account in there. And so the trust can't make the distribution because it doesn't fit the trust language. We have to re-engage with the attorney. Um, Ryan, I don't know. I don't know what your fees look like, but uh, families don't typically love uh, making multiple trips to their estate planning attorney uh, within, you know, a couple year time frame. So it's just something that if you don't currently have a trust, don't panic. But I, I would recommend uh, working with working with an estate planning attorney that has experience in dealing with special needs trusts specifically. I've mentioned ABLE accounts a couple times so far. Now we'll kind of get into the, into the details of it. So the Stephen Beck Jr. Achieving a Better Life Experience Act. Uh, so ABLE is actually an acronym, Achieving a Better Life Experience. Passed in December of 2014. So uh, so relatively new, uh, pretty new legislation that for the first time in, in history, an individual with, that experiences a disability was able to put money into a savings account without it counting against their needs-based benefits. Absolutely monumental legislation for the special needs community. Um, because again, up to that point, families were scratching and clawing to find any way to save for their loved one. Um, and they really didn't have any way to do it uh, on an, in an efficient way other than having a special needs trust. Um, but you can imagine 
having distributions made for the trust isn't as easy as, you know, sliding a card at, at McDonald's or ordering something on Amazon. Um, and that's really where ABLE accounts can, can have a, a huge impact. Again, it's, it's just, it's an option that what, from what we've seen, um, we're, we're good friends with David Bell, who is, uh, he runs the ABLE account for the state of Oregon and um, the state treasury. And he was telling us some, some statistics that were just mind blowing. I mean, it, uh, the amount of, of, of ABLE accounts that have been opened compared to how many families that would benefit from having them is, is microscopic. Uh, so it's, it's just a, a, a underutilized benefit that um, really has some fantastic features, which we'll get into. So again, the, the, the core concept of, of why this legislation was passed and why these accounts exist is that it allows an individual to save for the future, uh, whether long-term, short-term, invest, grow money, tax deferred, um, without ever having it count against your needs-based benefits. So you continue to, to receive both SSI and, uh, you know, all the great, all the great programs that, that uh, are provided through the county and the state wherever you may live. So one question that we often get is if these ABLE accounts are, are so great, why wouldn't I just have an ABLE account and not go through the cost and time of also establishing a special needs trust? And what we always say is don't look at it as an either or, it's always a both. It's always both. Although it might seem like they have similar attributes and similar uh, characteristics, they actually, uh, they work really well together. First reason being, ABLE accounts can only be funded with cash and not like you have to pull like cash, cash, but uh, you know, similar to how you'd move money from account to account, it has to be in cash. You can't, uh, you can't deposit any stocks, any bonds, um, mutual funds, anything like that when it's initially funded. Now, once the money's in there, that money can be invested in, and it depends on each state has their own different ABLE account program uh, with different investment options. But the annual contribution maximum is $15,000. There is no limit to a, a contribution max with a special needs trust, and so if you have a, a 401k at work or um, you know a, a Roth IRA, and you pass that on, that money cannot go into an ABLE account. That money has got to go into a special needs trust, which can then, if the trust is drafted properly, make distributions to an ABLE account. And now the ABLE account also has uh, a preloadable debit card, which is a fantastic feature. It also makes it very, very easy to track expenses to show that all the purchases that were made from this ABLE account were done for the primary benefit of the individual. Growth in this account accrues without any taxation. It's tax deferred. Fantastic benefit. And again, depending upon the state in which you live, you might also receive either a, a contribution, uh, a deduction on the front end or a tax credit. In Oregon, uh, it's up to a $300 tax credit and a little accounting 101 difference between credit and deduction. Credit actually lowers the amount of taxes that you owe. Deduction is just going to lower what your actual income is. Uh, so you're paying less taxes. Either way, it's a good thing. And then on the back end, the money's going to grow tax deferred. On the back end, these funds are accessible, completely tax-free. So you can tell that this legislation, uh, they they want people to be using these things. Uh, government typically really likes receiving taxes, and if they're going to have an account like this, um, you know that that essentially is is not taxable in any way. Uh, they're incentivizing it. If you had opened a, a five twenty nine college savings account, it's actually in the tax code an able account and a college savings account are essentially this seen in, uh, from, from the government's eyes, seen as a very similar vehicle. So those funds actually can be rolled, um, again, only up to $15,000 annually, but um, that money can be transferred back and forth. And, and for those that don't know, a, a college 529 is similarly structured in terms of being able to grow the money tax deferred, being able to pull out tax-free, 
uh, but those funds can only be used for qualified education expenses. So a little bit more, uh, I guess, tighter um, tighter requirements around 529s, whereas an ABLE account, the funds can be used for anything for the benefit of the individual. And again, to, to continue to still qualify for SSI, um, you would have to keep the total balance below 100,000. Now, obviously making $15,000 contributions as a max each year, it would take some time to get that account up to $100,000. And depending upon how old, how old uh, your loved one is, if they're no longer receiving SSI and they're, they've moved on to SSDI, this account can go above $100,000. You would not lose out on your SSDI benefit because again, that is not a needs-based, it's an entitlement benefit that's being paid to them because of the work credits that you've earned during your working years. So some of the things that an ABLE account can pay for. I think that the, the important thing to remember here is anything for the individual's primary benefit. And we have families say all the time, that's, that's so broad. Like that, that, that doesn't really give me, uh, that doesn't give me a, much structure. And, and they did that on purpose. Uh, they wanted the definition to be incredibly broad so that you can essentially use this for, for anything to benefit the individual. How am I doing on time? Okay, nice. So a few really, really important takeaways. I threw a lot at you today uh, and I probably overwhelmed a few of you, but it is never too late to start sitting down and really creating a plan uh, for, for your loved one's future. Letter of intent. Nobody knows your child as good as you do. And so what this document is gonna, is essentially going to allow you to do is is get all that information out of your head and onto a piece of paper that someone else would be able to step in. And again, nobody can replace you, but at least they would have a better understanding of, of what your life looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and they understand the important things that are, uh, yeah, they're involved in, in your loved one's life. Begin to position your child now for needs-based benefits. So whether your child is, uh, you know, just received diagnosis, or they're 15, 16, 17 years old. Uh, you know, if, if grandma left them a, a nice big uh, inheritance or, um, you know, you've been funding a, a college 529 or you've just been funding a savings account for them, start to have that $2,000 maximum in the back of your head simply because when that time comes and they turn 18, it's go time. And we want to make sure that uh, we are under that asset limit to get them on benefits as fast as possible. Uh, and again, um, you, you just want to make sure that you're, you're, you're thinking ahead and, and planning for that. Coordinate all available resources to, you know, to help reach your child's goals. You're not in this alone. I, as, as much as I know it feels that way, um, there are people out there to help. So ask questions. It's, uh, it's, it's not just confusing to you. A lot of people have been through it and they, uh, you know, they've, They've made it through. They've made a plan. Uh, so just make sure you're asking questions and and uh, and staying focused on the future. And then finally, uh, I can't tell you how many times the the comment has been, "Listen, I know I know we need a I know I know we need a special needs trust. I know it's just it's overwhelming. We haven't gotten to it. I literally don't know what tomorrow looks like. We're stressed out of our minds. Um, we can't even take that on right now. And unfortunately." Estate planning kind of has to happen soon because we don't know when you're going to go. And so if anything, I would say don't put off the estate planning uh, questions and, and considerations. That's It's something that unfortunately you, you, we've seen way too much of is families do put it off until it is too late. Uh, and then it's it's a whole mess, uh, you know, you know, a lot of things to pick up, you know, the, a lot of broken pieces to pick up on the back end. So another very important key. All right, questions for me. Thanks, Bobby. We did get a few questions coming awesome. in and uh, hopefully they make sense uh, now, given the, the time difference of when they were asked versus okay. uh, versus now. But And I think maybe you eventually ended up covering some of these, but I'm okay. just gonna run them by 
Absolutely. Just in case uh, they, they weren't asked. So Chris Hurst asked, should we not fund 529s? Because that would qualify us from the needs-based benefits? Great question. So the only reason that we, we typically recommend ABLE accounts over a 529 is the flexibility. Because one, you're going to get the, the, a, very, uh, a very similar tax situation, both on the growth and, and the disbursements. But ABLE accounts can be used for education and everything else, whereas a 529 is going to be simply just education. And so obviously we, we would have to understand a lot more about what else is going on, but that's just kind of a high level answer. I, I, it, if you're currently funding a, a 529, not a bad idea at all, because if the time comes and we're ready for needs-based benefits, it's a, a one piece of paper you fill out, you sign, and we can you know roll that money over into an ABLE account. Um, so it's not anything pressing. I would say continue to do uh, what you're doing, especially if you if you really like, uh, and I don't know who you have your 529 through, but uh, if you really like the investment options that are offered, you probably will have more investment options through XYZ uh, custodian, you know, whether TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, whoever. Uh, your 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 investment options are going to be much more diverse compared to your state sponsored able program. Um, again, I don't I don't want to speak for all the states, but uh, Oregon's plan has, has really solid, um, you know, index funds, low cost. Uh, they've performed really well since inception. So I'm, I'm not bashing those investment uh, options at all. But like I said, the, the, the selection is probably going to be much more, uh, you're going to get much more out of, out of a 529. So out I guess. A, if, a, oh, 529. Okay. F4 yeah. having more options. Exactly. For investment. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I hope that answers answer this question. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Carissa says, extend a huge thank you for offering up his own email. So thank you very much for offering <laughs> Yeah, of up. course. Of course. A lot of, a lot of these questions are individualized to a particular family. And so um, hopefully if, if you probably will get a few emails, I presume out of this. Which so I'm, I'm perfectly fine with. We, we, we would love them. Okay. Georgette uh, Chorus had a few questions. So Georgette says, so many questions. Ha ha, Florida <laughs> is so complicated. And I know you're not, you're on the West Coast, not uh, mm-hmm. down the Southeast. But uh, she says, I have my first meeting with SSI on May 10th because I filled out the application to register Ben as a disabled person. Uh, they, because they denied him Medicaid in Florida because okay. he wasn't registered with Social Security or SS. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, each each day is is obviously different. But um, well, first I would ask how old he is. If if he is over the age of of eighteen, um, obviously that would be the, the the time to to get that process started. Um, Georgette says three years old. Okay, so Georgette, they they might have declined him quickly because you you might have assets over two thousand dollars that Social Security can see or income above what the limit is. Um, that's typically the fastest decline that we see. So if it came back and you're like, okay, what the heck? Did you even read the paper? Uh, <laughs> that's that's usually the, the first thing. Um, but if not. They so Medicaid they're they're talking to each other. Social Security Administration has eyes everywhere. So uh, yes, I would I would say have the documentation from the doctor uh, on hand. Um, have if again if the individual is over the age of eighteen, have proof that his assets are below two thousand dollars. They know anyway. So we always say over uh, um, I guess over report and let them know because they're going to find out anyways. Uh, but if he's only three and you got that quick of a, of a, uh, of a denial, it might be due to uh, income and assets. Ellen has more of a comment here. Ellen Barenhaus, she says, have people check locally what is the best trust is in their state. For Ohio, we set up a regular family trust. The special needs trust would pass on to the state at the end while the family trust would go to the siblings. Great question. So depending upon what type of trust it is, you have first party special needs trusts and third party special needs trusts. Um, And again, without 
giving giving recommendations. I'll just give kind of a high level here. A first party special needs trust is when the individual actually receives the funds and then puts it into the trust. A third party is when it's going to be funded by the family. And so with a first party special needs trust, oftentimes you'll see what's a, a Medicaid payback is, is what she's probably referring to, which is the individual has been receiving all these great Medicaid pay, uh, benefits for their entire lifetime, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of benefits. And if it was a first party trust where he had the money, he, he or she had the money, put it into the trust, received the benefits. When he passes away, Medicaid essentially gets to recoup those funds. Now, in a third-party trust, um, it's a little bit different of a situation. So uh, I would say talk to, a, talk to a local estate planning attorney in your state, um, but that's at least what, what we've seen. Okay. And I think you answered this one. Georgette had a couple more questions here. So do you recommend a trust over an ABLE account? I think you said that they, they just work, they complement each other, right? Both. Absolutely both. Um, and I know it's, it's not one, it's not a fun conversation to have, and it's not a fun check to write. Um, but there are attorneys out there that will work on a flat fee basis and, um, and, and kind of get it done. Uh, you, you probably won't end up spending less than twelve to $1,500 to have a trust established. At least those are the numbers that we've seen, depending upon how complex your situation is. But for a, for a really effective and efficient plan, uh, absolutely both. Okay. And this is a natural follow-on question. So if we should have both, what percentage allocation should you put into each? Mm, great question. Great question. So with many fam what many families do is they have uh, what's called a testamentary special needs trust. So the trust will not actually go into existence until you go out of existence is the easiest way to put it. The trust essentially lies dormant in your will. So you have a will that says at my death, I will establish the Bob Howell special needs trust to which I will pass all of my assets. And so that is, is a common way that families will, will have their special needs trust drafted. But in their living years, they'll utilize the ABLE account as kind of a long-term savings and investment tool just because of how great, um, how great the, the, the growth can be uh, from a tax perspective. So um, if you don't have a trust yet, again, sit with an attorney, um, have these conversations. But um, yeah, from an allocation standpoint, I would say that continue with, with saving for your retirement and investing for your retirement. Um, but if you are saving specifically for your loved one, an ABLE account is just a fantastic place to do it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I know before we had Charlie who has CSS with, for our twins, we set up a testamentary trust, which springs into existence. So uh, just in case, you know, both parents, you know, die in a fiery car <laughs> crash uh, and the, the twins are still around so that our funds will go there. And then the trustee will sort of, you know, control it, how they get taken care of. Yeah. And it, and it saves, um, it saves you time on an annual basis because again, like I mentioned that the trust is, is essentially its own entity. And so what comes along with that is, uh, tax returns, it pays taxes. So, um, you know, to, again, every situation is going to be so different, but, uh, from, from a pl simplicity standpoint, we often see a testamentary trust and then saving into the ABLE account. How much time do we looks like we have a couple more minutes here awesome. kelly abbott says can we get a copy of your presentation or is that copyrighted no, it's definitely not copyrighted um yeah i'm more than happy to communicate with you guys to kind of get a, a list of um of whoever or again if if you guys like there's my email um just shoot me an email and say presentation and letter of intent whatever you guys need um i'll make sure i can get out to you great uh, Carissa asks, is it still true that you can open an ABLE account in any state, not just the state you live in? And what's the benefit of looking into different state accounts? Great question. So, um, and I'm actually glad you brought this up because I think I, I misspoke a little bit. Not every single state has their own program. Some states utilize one that covers multiple. In my opinion, it, it 
I would, I, if your state does have a program, I would use it um, just for, for simplicity and, and servicing and things like that. It's nice to have, have more of a local feel, but um, there's really, I, the, the, the pros and cons of, you know, I'm going to choose, I'm in Portland, Oregon, but I'm going to choose New York able because, you know, I like their, uh, their mutual fund options. Well, I mean, the, the fees are all very, very similar. Like I said, across the board, these accounts are typically low cost index funds. Uh, I wouldn't say it's, it's even worth the time researching other states, able programs. Um, I would, I would say utilize the one in your state. Okay. I think with respect, and I'm not sure about this, but I think like with the, the Connecticut where I'm at the 529 plan, there's maybe a, a state income tax deduction that you can get locally if you use the Connecticut one, which is kind of an incentive incentive to, to use Great Connecticut's point. plan. But yep. uh, I'm not sure if they have similar, if their uh, ABLE accounts are similarly structured, but I would probably start in your home state and then- Exactly. Okay. Yep, exactly. Uh, let's see. Got a couple that has been, this is great, super helpful. Thank you. Thank him so much. And uh, we're at one last question here. If you have a 529 for your child, can you change the name to a special needs third party trust? That way Medicaid doesn't see the account as the child's. Not- that, that, probably, that probably wouldn't be the, the, the best way to do it. Um, the best way to do it would honestly be to roll that 529 into an ABLE account and just anytime we're, we're using words like hiding or uh, maneuvering or <laughs> um, believe it or not, social security, uh, they know your social security number. They know your bank accounts. They know what's they, they've, they know what they're doing. They've done this a time or two. And so I would say there's, there's a proper way to do it, which would probably be um, open an ABLE account and move those funds over. Um, or again, you know, continue funding the five, two, nine, um, keep growing that money and then make a decision later on that money can be moved over any time and from sibling to sibling as well. So you can absolutely, uh, if, if there's a sibling in the picture, if you want, uh, to take those funds and, and open new five twenty nine and move the funds into a sibling's account where it's not going to be countable, that's an option as well. Thanks. Gabe asks a couple of questions, and this, this is a good one. Are there income limits to being able to contribute to an ABLE account? There are not. There are not. And anybody can contribute to an individual's ABLE account. So aunts, uncles, um, cousins, grandmas, parents, anybody can, 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 can contribute, but it's still a $15,000 maximum per year. And so one, I guess, uh, I guess planning tip that we often give is some families get a little too eager. Uh, they have the funds there. They want to get it invested. And so January 1st, they say, awesome, $15,000 contribution to the ABLE account. Let's let this puppy grow. It's going to be a great year for the market. Um, and then in November, December, when the holidays roll around, grandma and grandpa want to give Johnny, you know, $1,000. Well, if Johnny already has a thousand dollars in his account, and that thousand dollars is going to put him over the one thousand dollar asset limit, you don't have anywhere to put it simply because you funded your your five or I'm sorry, you funded your able account too soon. So don't make make the monthly contributions. Um, but I would always say leave a, a little bit of a buffer there just in case any unexpected money does come in. Uh, you can make that contribution previous to December thirty first because it's not. Um, the ABLE account is not similar to, to retirement accounts in the fact that you can contribute all the way up to the tax deadline. It's calendar year. So $15,000 from January 1st to December 31st. And another question from Gabe, are ABLE accounts subject to the Medicaid payback? Depends on your state. It depends on your state. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. In Oregon, they repealed the Medicaid payback, which was I mean, a big win for us and, you know, in our families. Uh, so great question. I, uh, I would type it in the Google machine for your state. Cause I'm not sure, but I know in the state of Oregon, uh, there is no Medicaid payback on, on able accounts. Okay. And then last question I have is from Chris Hurst again, it says, I think we get SSI benefits today about $190 as a family. 
we have more than $2,000 in assets, so we may not be eligible. What should we do? Interesting. I would, I'd be very curious at that amount. That's a very, uh, it's a strange amount to be receiving uh, SSI. It might be SSDI that you're receiving, uh, maybe from a parent or, um, yeah, it, it, under two hundred dollars in, in SSI, unless you are reporting your wages to Social Security on a monthly basis, and they're reducing it because you have earned income, um, that might be why it's it's that amount. But I would look at exactly what that benefit is because it doesn't sound like that that would be SSI just just from hearing the amount. Uh, and if you're not reporting your wages, because wages ultimately reduce. Um, and again, we could we could spend a whole another hour. Uh, going into employment and social security. But um, yeah, I would just, I'd be curious to see, um, I'd be curious to see why that benefit is the amount that it is. Um, and I would guess that it's probably SSDI. I'm not sure if I missed this in your presentation, but here's a question from me. Uh, it seems there's a process with SSI and the mm -hmm. other government benefits of, of making sure that your child has uh, qualifies because they're disabled. Is the ABLE account a similar type of process and who, who checks off that box? Is this the, the state agency there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's um, you go to your state's ABLE website and it's a, the online portal will ask, you know, for proof of um, essentially, you know, letter from your doctor, whatever may be proof of disability. Um, but honestly, and again, I don't know, I speak for Oregon when I say this, but um, opening an ABLE account is about 5,000 times cleaner and easier uh, than applying for SSI and uh, yeah, and government benefits. But yeah, we, we will walk families through uh, the entire process and usually they can have an ABLE account open within a couple hours. All right. Well, that's all the questions from the audience and anything that I had. Awesome. Bobby, and this I has been extremely helpful. Perfect. Yeah, exactly one hour. <laughs> I was so afraid of going over and, and yeah, anyways. No, yeah, this course. is perfect. Thank you for your time, your expertise. We really appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, please feel free everyone to reach out to Bobby. Uh, his, his, I sent the, his email address through the chat box. So you should be able to get it there. Or if you've written it down, that's good too. Or if you need it, I'm sure just send anyone at the foundation a, an email saying, what about that guy who knew all about all the money stuff? And we'll, <laughs> we'll redirect you to Bobby. Awesome. Okay. Thanks everyone. I appreciate it. Yep. You guys have a good weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.